Hey guys, I'm Chef Kevin Gillespie of Redbeard Restaurants, and I'm really excited to be back here at Atlanta Market in partnership with Atlanta Magazine's home. Today's going to be a lot of fun. I want to show you guys a couple of my absolute favorite summertime dishes. When it comes to summer, I love grilling, and frankly, I love kind of a tiki-esque cocktail. They're just personal favorites of mine. I make them at home. We make them in my restaurants a lot of the time, and these are two of my favorite versions that are super easy really approachable, something you can absolutely do at home and that I, in my opinion is gonna really kick your summertime grilling season up quite a few notches. So let's get started here. This first dish that we're gonna talk about is called char siu pork or red cooked pork or Chinese barbecued pork. It kind of goes by a lot of different names, but it shows up a lot in very classic American tiki culture. So when I say tiki culture, by the way, I'm talking about these bars that emerged, bars and restaurants, I should say, that emerged kind of post-World War II when a lot of our soldiers and sailors came back home from the Far East, they brought these stories of far-flung places and all of a sudden this really interesting thing took place in our country where we started creating dishes sort of inspired in many respects by these lands but also kind of with a little bit of fantasy included in it as well. This, on the other hand, is actually a very traditional Chinese recipe that kind of made its way into the canon of tiki culture. So I want to show you guys how to make it. So it starts with pork, obviously. If it's going to be barbecued pork, we got to have a cut of pork. Now, this is where you get a lot of different choices. There's really no hard and fast rule for what cut of pork you use. There's tons of recipes out on the internet that use pork belly, for example. There's a lot of them that use pork loin or pork tenderloin even for something to cook really quickly. But for me, my personal opinion is that the absolute best thing you can use is pork shoulder. Pork shoulder, to me, is one of these sort of perfect cuts, if you will. It has an unbelievable mix of lean meat, as you can see, but also really great marbling, really great fat. And as you guys know, fat is where all of the flavor comes from. But the other benefit to the fat is that, well, it sort of makes this really easy on us. Pork shoulder is one of the easiest things in the world to be able to cook because it's pretty much impossible to overcook it. And so I like it for advanced cooks, but I love it for beginners too because it's really, really forgiving. So in front of me here, what I have is actually called a pork steak, which is kind of a funny terminology, but this is a piece of the shoulder. So in the shoulder, you obviously have your shoulder blade. Everybody can understand that. Well, that's what this little bone is right here. This is the shoulder blade. And so what you have here is a pork shoulder that has actually been sliced across that bone. And the only reason that's important for you guys to know is that we have a couple really great factors in this from a flavor and cooking standpoint. The bone that's in this does a great job of ensuring that we keep a lot of juices in there. The bone is kind of like the bulletproof vest, if you will, for cooking this because it's gonna make sure that it's almost impossible for us to dry it out. The other benefit to this is you have all of these different muscles. You can kind of see where they all connect together. And the more of those connection points that exist, generally speaking, the higher the flavor content. However, there is a downside. Pork shoulder is traditionally really tough. That's why usually you see it done in like American barbecue where it's slow cooked until it falls apart. However, when you have a cut like this, the pork shoulder, you've actually accomplished something called manual tenderizing, which is kind of a silly term that doesn't mean much to most folks. But what it literally means is we've sliced through it and we've made it tender that way. So these thin steaks are really great. They cook fast. They're actually surprisingly tender, and we're gonna get all of the big flavor from pork shoulder. So, let's mix up a marinade for this. In an ideal world, I would have this marinated overnight, and I'll show you that in just a minute here. The reason being that the longer this can sit in the marinade, the more flavor you're gonna get. But also, you're gonna accomplish some sort of tenderizing qualities while it sits in the marinade. So, the marinade is pretty straightforward. In this bowl, in front of me right here, I have a mixture of a couple different things. I have some honey, just plain Jane clover honey. I also have some soy sauce. Now, you can choose a low sodium soy sauce for this. You could in fact choose a tamari or a gluten-free soy sauce. The flavor is gonna be identical, so the choice is up to you there. And then I also have some fresh chopped garlic, and I've mixed these together. I've also added an ingredient that nobody really wants to talk about, but that is 100% legit from a traditional standpoint, and that's red food coloring. I know it sounds insane, but traditionally this recipe was made with something called Shaoxing wine. And Shaoxing wine would cause a red color effect. However, it's nearly impossible to find nowadays. And so usually people substitute in dry sherry, which is what I have in this bowl as well, and then a couple drops of food coloring to create that red color. So much of this is a visual quality. 
tiki culture in general is all about the visual and the presentation. And so to me, adding those couple drops of food coloring is completely legit. If you're not comfortable with it, leave it out. It's gonna taste the exact same. It just won't have as much of that intense red color. So that's what I have in the bowl right here. We need to add a couple more ingredients to it. So I've said before, we already have some honey in here, but believe it or not, we actually need more sugar. This is kind of a, a crazy recipe in the volume of sugar that goes into it. Bear with me, you're not gonna eat all of the sugar, but what you do want is to build that really strong caramelization. So I've added to my mixture here, just some plain granulated white sugar. And it's gonna have kind of a gritty texture, by the way, guys. Eventually that grittiness will break down. Sugar is uh, what's called a liquefier, so it literally pulls the moisture out of everything. So by the time you take this steak out of marinade, you won't notice any of that grittiness, but the marinade's gonna feel a little bit funky and maybe a little bit on that gritty side. You can actually hear it when I'm stirring it here. So, a couple other ingredients to add to it. Believe it or not, the soy sauce doesn't have enough salt in it, so we actually have to add a little bit more salt. So some kosher salt to this as well. I'm just gonna set that right there and give this a stir up. And again, salt is also a liquefier, meaning that it's going to eventually melt down in here. You're not gonna see these big salt crystals. Um, and it's gonna cause something to take place. For meat to marinate, we need to create an osmotic reaction. Super nerdy language, but what we're trying to accomplish here is that we need the moisture, the water, literally, it's present in the pork to leave the pork. But, and this is the most important part, we need to give it enough time to come back. It's sort of like, just sort of steps outside, takes a look around, and then comes back. But when it comes back into the pork steak, it pulls all those flavors and the marinade along with it. And the salt is critically important for this to happen because that's sort of the facilitator that opens the door and allows this process to take place. So, mix our kosher salt in there. Two more ingredients here, white pepper. Now, white pepper gets a bad rap. A lot of chefs don't like it, a lot of chefs love it. I will tell you that it is incredibly strong, very, very powerful, much more so than black pepper. And so this is not something that we would call a substitute for black pepper. White pepper has a very unique flavor to it uh, and an intensity, a spicy heat to it that's hard to replicate. And so I would tell you, don't swap black pepper in for this. Try to find white pepper. However, you gotta be careful with it. That was really a half a teaspoon of white pepper. A little goes a long way, but the flavor is very, very noticeable and I wouldn't do this dish without it. And then the next ingredient is maybe arguably the most important of them all, and it's Chinese five spice powder. It has an incredible aroma, star anise, cinnamon. It's really got this beautiful mix of literally five spices. And that to me is the marquee flavor profile of this dish. It really comes through when it cooks and it adds this wonderful sort of mysterious spicy note that you can't quite pick out what it is. Is it cinnamon? Is it star anise? Is it fennel? Like, what is that? And that's where this is really, really beautiful. So here's our marinade, guys. Really very kind of thick, almost syrupy looking, and that's exactly what we expect. And so all we have to do is pour it over our pork and let it marinate. So in my refrigerator right here in front of me, I have like your basic kind of zip top bag. And this is the way I like to marinate it for the sake of not being uber messy. Because the other thing to remember here is that the red food coloring that's in this will also get on you, so be careful when you're using it. So I like to use tongs for this as best I can. Let's go ahead and put our pork steak in the bag here. I'll move this plate out of the way for just one moment here. So we'll kind of put our pork steak in our zip top bag, shimmy it around a little bit. And then I think it's easiest just to pour the marinade on one side and then sort of flip it over. Let me show you what I mean by that. So. Take your marinade here, kind of split it up, pour about half of it right on top. That looks good. And then take and just flip your bag over and pour the remaining half right there. Beautiful. So, just kind of shimmy it down in here, flatten it out as best you can, just so that you really make sure this marinade gets on everything. So, as you can see, it's really vibrant. And then, Close your bag, but when you get towards the end here, just kind of give it a press and try to get as much of that air out of the bag as you possibly can. What we don't want is for this to oxidize. And that air that's sort of present in there, well, it just, it's not harmful. It just kind of discolors the meat. So we want the marinade to be on this as even as possible. So I kind of squeegee it over to cover everything and then roll my bag up flat like this. And what I try to remember to do 
is I'll put this in my fridge and then if I think about it sometime kind of during the day, I'll just flip it over one time. You know, if you forget to do it, it's not the huge deal, but if you can give it that flip, it just helps kind of gravity settle the marinade into the pork. It seems to marinate just a little bit better. And so this is gonna go in our fridge and it's gonna sit overnight. Overnight, by the way, is such a vague term because how long is overnight? I would say what this means, generally speaking, is that it can marinate for anywhere from eight to 12 hours. And so after that time, ta-da, miracle of television here. This is one that I did yesterday that has sat overnight. And you can see, look at how intensely red it is. It just looks unbelievable. Um, you still see some of these sort of pieces of garlic on it, but it has this, I don't know, it's shiny. You know, we haven't, this is just the marinade. We haven't put anything else on this. And I just love the way that it looks. The other pro to it is that there's no more seasoning. We don't need to do anything else to this. It's gonna be perfect the way that it is. It's got plenty of salt, as you saw. It's got plenty of pepper. Um, and for me personally, when I grill these, I'm not worried about oiling anything. And the reason, well, we have sort of our own natural basting built in here. So we don't need to oil our pan. So speaking of, let's toss this thing on the grill. So if I was at home, I'd do this outside on a charcoal grill over medium to medium low heat. And there's a reason for that tons of sugar in this marinade and what does sugar like to do it likes to burn and so we don't want it to burn now we do want some charring and we're going to get some sort of charring on this but you got to be careful there's a very fine line between delicious charred grill marks and charcoal and unfortunately it's not a big gray area it's a very thin razor thin margin if you will so i have my grill pan over here over that same medium low heat so let's go ahead and put this into the pan Oh man, that's beautiful. And we're gonna let this sit here and do its thing. And by the way, if it ever gets too hot, if we think it's cooking too quickly, well, we'll just take a peek down here and we'll adjust our temp down. I'd rather this take a while to cook, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, than we try to do it super fast and burn it. Now, we'll know when it's done by the way that it sort of shrinks up and i'll point that out to you here in a few minutes as well but for now let's just leave this to do its thing i'm going to move these dirty dishes out of the way and then let's talk about the perfect sort of summertime drink so going back to this sort of tiki idea you have two founders of the tiki movement and people kind of argue back and forth over who's really the legitimate one. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on a gentleman named Vic Bergeron, or as most people know him, Trader Vic. Trader Vic was actually a legitimate guy, and for a while, especially during the 60s and 70s, there were Trader Vic restaurants all over the country. One of the reasons I've chosen to do this today is because one of the very few remaining Trader Vic's restaurants in the United States is actually right here in downtown Atlanta, and I love it. It has personal significance to me. It's actually where my grandparents went on their first date with each other, and so I love it for that reason, and I wanna share with you guys a signature drink of that restaurant, the Mai Tai. Now, the Mai Tai obviously is famous for good reason, but the Mai Tai is an interesting drink because when you break down the pieces of it, you realize that it's actually pretty close in its composition to a margarita. And that kind of breaks up some of that like mystery of what it really is. And there's no, that's not a coincidence. Vic Bergeron, the founder of Trader Vic's, actually owned a Western style restaurant before he owned Trader Vic's called Hinky Dinks that was famous for its margaritas. And I have to believe that this drink is just sort of an evolution of that theme. So it's pretty straightforward. It starts with fresh lime juice, just like a margarita would. And you'll notice I haven't squeezed this lime juice yet. And the reason for that is that citrus in general, limes, lemons, oranges, whatever, they degrade really, really fast, meaning they start to taste not so great in pretty short order. And so juicing your limes, juicing your lemons, whatever your citrus fruit is, and this is not just for a Mai Tai, really for any drink you're making in general, you wanna do that sort of at the last minute if you possibly can. It's gonna make an enormous difference. So before we juice these, Let's take a peek back over here at our grill. So if you need to, you can always take a spatula in here and just kind of really get underneath it, make sure that it pulls up. There we go, that's perfect. Excellent. Okay, cool. So let's do this. Rather than flipping it over right now, let's just go ahead and give it kind of a half turn. So we're just kind of adjusting it around on the pan here so that we get, well, so we get a little bit more even browning. Uh, anytime you lay it on a, on a pan, 
the issue is you come into contact with that surface, it reduces the temperature of that surface. So we want to move it so that it continues to cook at relatively the same temperature. Again, let's watch this temp here. We, don't want, to, we want to make sure that this thing doesn't cook too fast. So let's turn it down a little bit if we need to and just let this thing do a little bit more of what it's doing. Now, when we flip this over, you're gonna look at it and go, oh my God, Kevin, did we burn it? No, that is that charring effect that we're talking about. Those are those sugars that are really, really achieving that super dark caramelization. And that's part of this. There's the bitter sweet taste flavor profile, what we would call it as chefs, that we're trying to achieve when we make char siu pork. And so we need a little bit of that burning, but what we don't want to have is for that to carry on all the way through to the center and end up giving us a piece of sort of overcooked charcoal. So we're going to let this chill for a minute. Let's go back to our cocktail and keep talking about this. So fresh lime juice, fresh citrus juice in general, best done at the very last minute. I'm going to sort of cheat here a little bit and use a citrus reamer for this. It just makes your life of juicing a lemon, a lime, an orange a little bit easier. So you kind of just give this thing the business. And we're gonna juice it right into this measuring cup and I'll show you why here in just a second. So this drink calls for one ounce of lime juice, which oftentimes it's written up as one lime. The issue that I have found guys is that limes are maybe the most unpredictable of all the citrus fruit as far as how much liquid one of them has in it. So I would tell you, Never count on one lime being enough. It may be, it may not be. So, just got just a little bit more here. I think we're just short of an ounce at the moment. Now I'm keeping these lime holes, by the way, guys. I'm not throwing these in the garbage and you'll see why here in just a second. Okay. Go ahead and juice this one too for good measure. All right, we have our ounce of lime juice. I'm gonna go ahead, flip our pork steak here. Yeah. Again, do not sweat the color of this. It's gonna taste fantastic. What I am gonna do here, because we flipped this over, on the second side, we want it to cook really, really low and slow. So I'm turning down the heat on my grill pan to uber low. Like, literally this stove has a simmer setting so this is like what you would use if we wanted to melt butter. We're turning it down to that. The other thing is that this is made out of cast iron. So cast iron is gonna carry its heat for a super, super long time. And so we are gonna be able to cook on this thing for quite a while. Now, I do wanna point out something that's taking place because this is how we judge if it's done. You'll notice here that the bone inside this pork steak is starting to retract from the meat. And that's a good sign. That tells us that we're up to temp now. The interior of this has gotten up at least to 150 degrees. And so it's pulling away from that. And that's what we want when we're cooking this. This ideally is gonna be taken off the grill at closer to 165, 170 degrees. It's a little higher than you would expect. And in most books that would be well done. Or even if you're talking lean pork, like a pork loin, it'd be overcooked. But for a cut like this with so much fat inside it, we really have to get it up to that temperature for it to be nice and tender. So back to our cocktail mise en place here. So we have our lime juice. Let's talk about our other ingredients. Obviously it's a tiki drink here, which means that more than likely we're gonna be using rum in it. And that is exactly what we have right here. This is a Jamaican rum, two ounces of aged Jamaican rum. And I'm gonna go ahead and pour that directly into my cocktail shaker. Now in this little glass here, I have a mix of things and they're in such small quantities that I wanted to go ahead and mix them together. But let me tell you what I have here. The first is something called Demerara syrup. So Demerara is a type of unrefined sugar. It's not quite brown sugar, but it's sort of a golden looking sugar. And so I've made a basic simple syrup from this, two parts sugar to one part water. So in other words, two cups of sugar, two tablespoons of sugar, to the same measurement again of water. And all I've done is allow that to come up to a boil so the sugar melts and then cooled it down. So that's in this glass. There's also another spirit in here called dry curacao. Curacao, the island of curacao, is famous for producing bitter oranges. And so this is a spirit that is made in that style. Another, probably the most famous curacao if of them all is Grand Marnier. That is a curacao style orange liqueur. So in this, I have dry curacao. I also have our secret ingredient, if you will, for a Mai Tai, and to me, the one that is, gives it sort of that distinctive flavor, and it's called Orgeat. Orgeat, O-R-G-E-A-T, is an almond syrup. And so you take bitter almonds, 
and literally cook them down into a syrup. It's absolutely delightful. You can make your own Orgeat at home and there are recipes online, or you can purchase a brand, a reputable brand like Gifford and use that in here as well. So Orgeat, Demerara syrup, and dry curacao. And you'll notice it's kind of syrupy looking into our cocktail shaker. And then we need to add our lime juice, but we have to measure it. So all day today, when I'm measuring these out, I'm using this thing. This is a cocktail jigger. In fact, this is what's called a Japanese jigger, which that means that it's two ounces on the big side and one ounce on the small side. So this makes it really easy for us. We need one ounce of lime juice. And I'm gonna strain this as I pour it, mostly just because I don't want the chunks of lime in my juice, in my cocktail that is. Just kind of tap it here to make sure we get our full one ounce. That looks good. Pour that back. And then let's add our one ounce of lime juice here. So let's take a peek back over here at our pork one time. I wanna give it that last turn 45 degrees the other way here, just to finish its cooking. There we go. And I think that's gonna be ready for us here in just a moment. Now, shaking a cocktail, well, it's not an uber precise thing, I should, I should say, but there's definitely some technique to cocktail shaking. And depending on what bartender you ask, they'll tell you which way they like to do it. For me, I think this drink is critical that you get it really, really well shaken. And more importantly, this is one of those drinks that you have to use the right ice. So let me get it out of the freezer and show you. So in my bowl right here, I have what's called cracked ice. What that basically means is, you know the store-bought bag ice that you can buy out of the giant chest freezers? Well, you basically take it and break it up a little bit. And so what we have here is a mixture of pieces that are a little bit bigger and pieces that are almost like snow cone small, and that's what you want. The reason for that is that the smaller ice is going to melt much, much faster, and it's gonna dilute this drink, because otherwise, a Mai Tai, well, it has two ounces of rum in it for every one of these little drinks, and so you gotta be careful on that. So you want the small ice. Now, the big ice is not going to melt as fast, and it's gonna stay put, and we need that as well because it's going to really cool our drink, our glass down, and ensure that we don't get dilution levels that are too high. So. In my shaker here, you can see it's super frosted on the outside. That's what you want. You put a ton of ice in these. And I know that sounds crazy. You think, well, Kevin, why does it need that much ice? You can't put that much in here. The key is getting this drink cold as fast as possible so that you don't water it down. So shaking method, different for everybody. I kind of have this like locomotive thing going on. I don't know. I'm not sure if this is the most traditional or the right one, but it works for me. And I like to go literally till my hands are so cold that I feel like they're gonna freeze to the side of it. That's kind of my, my general go-to is that I want this thing to be super frosty, you know, winter in the north, northeast kind of cold, and that's when I know I'm done. So when you make a Mai Tai, technically you're supposed to free pour it, and what that means is that you basically pour everything into the glass at one time, but at some point you'll run out of room, so you kind of just have to tip it to the side here and pour it in. Fill it up as high as you can get it. There we go, whoops. And if you get a couple extra pieces of ice, no big deal, we'll just chuck those off to the side. The garnish for a Mai Tai is in fact, one of your little pieces of lime, float that bad boy right there on top, and then some fresh mint, is that this now looks like a tropical island with a palm tree on it. And so that's your classic Mai Tai. And it is going to go perfectly with what we have right here, our char siu pork. And I know that it's ready, and let me show you how I know that it is ready. So, off of the grill here, look at this, this thing is beautiful. This bone has pulled back nicely from here. We're also seeing juices rise to the surface. So when we finally see that liquid kind of come up to the surface, we've achieved that sort of perfect temperature inside that we're looking for. But it hasn't run everywhere. We don't have a pan full of juice here, meaning that we still keep most of that juice inside our pork. Now, I would tell you guys to allow this to rest just for a couple of minutes here while we chat. And the reasoning for that is something called carryover cooking. Anytime you cook, but especially when you're dealing with protein, and that's not just meat, that could be fish, it could be poultry. What happens is that a lot of energy is generated when you're cooking. It gets really, really hot and the inside gets really hot. And a lot of folks think that, well, I just took it off the heat, it's done cooking, but it doesn't work that way. That energy takes a minute to dissipate. And so what ends up happening is that it'll continue to come up a couple of degrees 
before it eventually levels out. Think of it this way. When you cook meat protein and it gets hot, it turns into this tight little ball and you need to give it a few minutes to relax. Just like when you get home from work. You just need a few minutes to relax before everything's okay. That's what we're doing here. We're letting this meat have that couple few minutes to relax so that we keep all of the juices inside the pork, the chicken, the steak, whatever it may be, and that's gonna ensure that this thing comes out perfectly for us. How long? Honestly, three or four minutes is perfectly fine. If you wanna give it more than that, you absolutely can. In fact, I think char siu pork is just as good at room temperature as it is hot. So this makes it a really forgiving dish to serve, especially if you have a party during the summertime, because you could grill these off earlier in the day and then you can either just rewarm them a little bit, or as I said, you can serve them directly as is at room temperature as a nice little appetizer. So let's slice this thing up. Now, we have to be concerned with this bone in here, and so I'm just gonna go ahead and sort of cut the bone away from this big chunk right here. On the other side, it's a little bit trickier because it has sort of a Y-shaped bone, so you'll go in and you'll carve those away. Again, use that bone as sort of your guide, and you can pull away then your nice big chunks of meat. So here's a second one for us. When you get over here to these sides, where you just have these little small pieces, you can keep these, or if you wanna do what every professional chef does, those are kinda of your snacks because you did the work. So we'll just act like those don't exist. And then when we slice this up, we wanna make sure that we do it across the grain. So the protein in this particular piece is running this way, which means that we slice it across like this. In this piece right here, the protein is running this way, and so we slice it the other direction. So let's take this little cap off right here just so we get nice even pieces. So we slice them like this. And the reasoning again for that, what we talked about in the very beginning, we are actually manually tenderizing this. We're making it tender by slicing it up. And so just take some of this over here. Look at this color. Again, I know it, it can look dark, but then when you really get a look at it, you realize, oh no, it's this really bright, dark red color. Absolutely beautiful perfect char siu pork. Now to me guys, this right here epitomizes summertime. Something grilled, nice, bright, fresh drink, ice cold, perfect any time of year, but especially perfect during the summer. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope you get a chance to visit me in Atlanta and, a vis and to visit the Atlanta market when you're here in town. Um, until the next time, guys, I really appreciate you letting me cook with you. I'm Chef Kevin Gillespie. You guys have a nice day. Take care.